Hi, everybody, and welcome to the BioCell webinar number 73. Today, we have uh, Marta Llorenz Linares from MBL European Bioinformatics Institute, and she will speak about competency frameworks to support training, design, and professional development. So I'm hosting this webinar. I'm Alessandra Villa, and I'm located at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. With me, it's Otto Andersson from the Finnish IT Center for Science. Um, I just want to inform you that the webinar is a recorder. So during the webinar, you can ask questions, usually the Q&A function that is on the bottom of Zoom application depends on which uh, so operating system you have. You can see this symbol or this symbol. And when you could also tell us if you have or not a microphone. Usually at the end of the webinar, we will unmute you so you can ask your question directly to Marta. Or if you have no microphone, I will read the question for you. After the webinar, we have also, we, uh, if there are still questions, for one week, Marta will be able to answer to your question in the forum of askbyexcel.eu. And there you can see that there is a, will be a subcategory dedicated to this webinar, webinar number 73. And Marta will be able there for one week. So now I would like to tell you something about Marta. Marta is a scientific protein manager within the training team OMBL European Bioinformatic Institute. She's uh, working in many European projects, among others, per MedCOE, and previously she was also working for BioExcel. She also developed organized competence-based training activity for several other European projects or project in general. She has experience in running trainer, train the trainer course, knowledge exchange workshop, and webinar series. And now she's currently responsible for the development of MBL competency app. And this is what she will tell something more now. Please, Marta. Thank you, Alessandra. So let me share that one. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I will, uh, as Alessandra said, I will be talking about competencies. So I'll be talking about uh, competency frameworks and how we use them to support training, uh, design, and professional development. Um, I work at the MBLE BI training team, and therefore training design is really uh, key uh, in our work, and that's quite important for, for us. But I want to show you also how you can use uh, competencies for your own uh, professional development, your career choices and things like that. Because when we talk about competency frameworks, sometimes it feels that it's very abstract. It's something that it's very top level or very general. And it's like, what's in it for me? But I would like to show you how this is, um, this helps us with quite common conversations or quite common questions or issues that we might have in our uh, daily life. So for example, we have here a life scientist uh, that will start doing simulations soon and will need to improve my computational, their, their computational skills. So it's like they are wondering how they can do this. Um, and then there are might be other people saying, what do I need to become a computational chemist or uh, some other uh, job role? And these are things that we think quite uh, commonly in our life, but we are we might not be sure where to find information about it or how to address them. And a, a competency-based approach can provide a structured framework for this. So it defines competencies, career profiles, and related training, and it can help us addressing uh, these uh, questions or these issues related to both training, developing skills, or uh, yeah, professional development in general. It also provides a common language so that you can talk to other people that share the same framework 
in the same terms, using the same kind of words, so it's easy uh, to understand each other. So in this presentation, I'm going to tell you about competencies and about the MBLE BI competency hub. And then I will show you how we can use competencies, showing two examples of what we have done. One is uh, how the BioXL training program is developed. And another one is how you can use the MBLE BI competency hub to, to plan your own professional development. I will have a summary slide at the end just to finish uh, with what with all what I said. So a competency is an observable ability of any professional that integrates uh, multiple components such as knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And these ones help us define in a bit more detail the competency. And then a competency framework lists the competencies for specific groups of professionals. And when we are talking about these uh, competency-based approaches, they have uh, certain features that make them uh, quite practical. One of them is that competencies are observable, so you can validate them objectively. And this means that evidence of uh, competence uh, can be collected, and then it can be used as shared currency. So again, if you share a competency framework with someone else, you will be talking the same language, and you can say, I have competence in this uh, or that. Uh, other ability or knowledge or so on and then they will immediately understand what you're talking about so this can help when you are looking for a job or when you are doing some uh, appraisal or so um, so as an example uh, we can have a competency that says install or deploy pre-built software on a desktop or server computer and as i said Competencies can have uh, some more elements that help us define them in more detail, like knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Uh, and here I have some examples on these slides. So for knowledge, the stages of software release cycles or the dependencies of the software. For skills, uses package managers is able to revert, to revert a system to a known state. And for attitudes, consults the manual or checks licensing before installing or running software. And on this slide, I'm showing you two of each, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Uh, but in general, in the frameworks that we've worked on, we have a few more. I would say between three and four and, and six or so, because then it gives us a quite good uh, level of detail and granularity within each competency. So these competencies can be used for a few things. And this is only uh, some examples on this slide. As I said, I'm working in the training team. So for us, uh, using them for course development is uh, quite relevant for our work. And they can help you to determine what content to include in some course or training program development, because uh, depending on the competencies that your target audience uh, needs to have, you can decide uh, which content to include in that course. And then they also help you uh, to pitch the content at the right level, because again, that would be a combination of understanding what the competence level of your audience is and which competencies you want them to develop. So then you can see whether to start at a more intro introductory level or at a more advanced level if they already have a certain uh, level of competence. Uh, and once you combine which competencies you want your trainees to develop and what's their actual level, you can easily write le the learning outcomes that will tell you what they will be able uh, to do after the training course. Then competencies can also be used for career development, and this can be at a more individual uh, level. So you can uh, use them to think about your continuing professional development, to assess yourself, to decide which competencies to develop further. But they can also be used uh, by institutions or organizations in annual appraisals or assessments. So if your institution has a, a competency framework, this can be the common framework for a line manager and an employee to uh, discuss about how uh, their performance ha have been during the last year and to assess how it's going and what the goals for the next year or which competencies to develop uh, in the next year. Uh, and they can also be used for staff hiring because of course they give you an idea of um, the competencies that your team uh, has and the ones that uh, you need to, to be looking for in new employees. So at Embley BI uh, training team, we have been working in competencies for, for a few years. And when we started developing competency frameworks in the, 
in the context of uh, some European Union funded projects or some other initiatives like the competency framework for the International Society for Computational Biology, we, we have them mostly in reports, in project reports, uh, that even if they are public, they are sometimes not very easily accessible uh, for everyone or it's not easy to find them. So we thought that uh, a competency framework was a very good resource for anyone to have. Uh, and we decided to build this um, website, the MBLBI Competency Hub, to make all this um, work available for anyone so that they can use them in their own uh, professional development or when they are um, developing their own training courses. So in the Competency Hub, uh, at the moment, you can browse career profiles, you can assess your competencies, you can get information to design training courses and uh, training programs, or you can find relevant training courses to develop uh, certain competencies. Uh, right now, there are nine competency frameworks in the Competency Hub, which is this nine that you see uh, up here. They are for certain areas of uh, computational biology and then also for professionals working in research infrastructures, for data stewards, or for professionals working with uh, human data. Today in this presentation, my examples will be on the framework on computational biomedical research, which is the one that was developed by uh, BioXL. So in this uh, competency framework, we have a list of competencies, and I'm going to go in a moment to the site so we can see them there. Uh, we have the list of competencies in, in different domains, and then we have a series of career profiles and a series of uh, trained resources that you can access from there and that are associated with the competencies. And I'm going to show you that on, on the side, um, but I will Later on during the presentation, I will do a more detailed uh, demo of the site. So now, again, this is the landing page, and we have those uh, nine cards, each of them uh, going to a specific uh, competency framework for a specific group of professionals. So if we go to the one in computational biomolecular research, uh, we can see the information that it's uh, in here. We have some career profiles uh, to start with, and I will show you how they work a bit later during my presentation, but we have this list of career profiles. Then we have the, the competencies that in BioXL are divided in three uh, different domains, which is scientific competencies, computing competencies, and parallel computing competencies. And some of them are apply expertise in formal and natural sciences appropriate to the discipline and follow best practice in experimental design or user-driven service provision and support. And if we click on each of them, we will expand them and we will see, as I show you, the different elements inside each of them, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, which help us understand what's uh, in this competency and what's uh, the detail that it has. Then we have uh, some training resources that, again, are associated uh, with these competencies. So you have a, a full list of um, training resources. And you will always uh, be able to see which competencies they relate to, they help you develop. So we have, for example, this beginner's guide to interpreting results from biostatistics, and it's related to a, a competency on data-driven science, or there's another one about licensing, and that one is the, uh, associated with the competencies about uh, licensing policies. We also have some uh, learning pathways, which, we, which should be appearing there. Um, which help you are a collection of uh, training resources that are put together um, for to address specific challenges that we think that uh, our target audience might have. And I will show you one of them uh, in a bit more detail later. So if we now go back to the presentation, I'm going to tell you how we are using this uh, BioXL competency framework for two use cases. One is the BioXL training program, and the other one is how to plan your professional development using the uh, EBI competency hub. So um, if we start with the BioXL training program, um, I'm going to start with a short presentation about a uh, short introduction about BioXL. So BioXL is the European Center of Excellence for Computation and Biomolecular Research. And its mission is to provide open source molecular modeling and simulation software 
user support and community building events for life scientists. So in order to enable these life scientists to use the software that BioXcel uh, is providing, BioXcel developed a competency-based training program. And what this means is that the training program is focused on the abilities that are required for professionals in computational biomolecular research. And therefore, we needed to define these competencies and certain career profiles to start with to be able to design the training courses on top of that. And in addition to defining the competencies, we did a training needs analysis to pri prioritize the topics um, that our users have in um, have more need for because we cannot cover absolutely all the competencies with the limited resources of the project. Uh, so that's why the training needs analysis was added there. So to start with uh, developing the, the BioXL competency framework and defining these competencies for uh, computational biomolecular research, we started with some related uh, competency frameworks, like the one from the International Society for Computational Biology, uh, or the ones developed by the Corbell project and the RI train project, which were more focused on research infrastructures. Um, so this provided like an initial draft uh, list of competencies. And we also defined some uh, initial user groups defined in quite broad terms as beginner users, advanced users and system administrators. And with that information, we gathered uh, some experts together in a workshop so they could decide which competencies were really relevant for, um, for BioXL and at which level uh, each of the different types of users had them. Uh, and then this allowed us to define uh, the first version of the framework with the competencies for professionals in, in computational biomolecular research. But uh, as you use the framework, you can realize that some competencies need more detail or that some others might not be uh, so relevant because everybody knows them. So they might not be not so relevant for uh, us to develop our training program. Um, and then there are also some new methodologies, some new competencies that are required in the field. For example, right now, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence in um, all areas of our lives from everybody using ChatGPT to uh, artificial intelligence being used in many different uh, research uh, areas. So we need to keep an eye on those developments and we need to uh, constantly revise uh, what the competency framework includes. So that's why the current version of the, of the framework for professionals in computational biomolecular research is, framework, is version three. This is something that you can see on the, on the competency hub, and you can also check the previous versions uh, if you want to. So this current version um, has uh, 17 competencies in three domains, as I told you earlier, scientific competencies, computing competencies, and parallel computing competencies. And each of them has a series of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And they are quite... Um, focus on computation biomolecular research and on the uh, software development and provision that BioXL does, because that's where uh, BioXL is putting uh, its focus. But we also consider that for these professionals, there are some other more general uh, competencies in more transversal skills, such as communication or project management uh, or teamwork that are also required, uh, but we are not including them in this uh, framework, we think there are also, there are some other uh, more general frameworks like the, the one from the International Society for Computational Biology or the one from the, from the European Union for Research that include those uh, kind of competencies in more detail. So in addition to the competencies, we also define uh, career profiles, which are um, roles with um, associated uh, competencies and uh, certain levels that they have, uh, like a PhD student in biomolecular simulation, a computational chemist, or a research software engineer. And on this slide, you can see an example from the competency hub with the junior research software engineer. So you see for some of these, we have different career stages, so we can have a junior and a senior one. And then we show 
some text on qualification and background of this uh, example um, persona and also what the activities of the current role are. And then we have the full list of uh, competencies in the framework and at what level uh, that competency is required for this role. Um, and once we have that, it also, when we are def uh, designing training, which is the part I'm explaining you now, um, it helps us understand our target audience. Uh, so it helps us uh, designing this training because we can see what uh, competencies and at what level uh, the target audience uh, has them and therefore which ones they need to, to develop and whether we need to start in the training course at a more introductory or a more uh, advanced level. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you a couple of examples of in a minute. And then later on, we'll uh, talk a bit more about these career profiles in, in the context of uh, thinking about your professional development. So when we have these uh, career profiles and the competencies defined, we can really develop our training courses targeted to these uh, specific user groups and their needs. So for example, this one says, I will need HPC for my simulations and I don't know where to start. Um, so this issue uh, has prompted BioXL to develop some courses like Introduction to HPC for Life Scientists, which is a course that has run uh, already several times, uh, or to develop this learning pathway on using HPC infrastructure to perform biomolecular simulations. Uh, and I'll show you that learning pathway in a bit more detail so that you see what a learning pathway in the, in the competency hub is. So we have uh, this using HPC infrastructure to perform biomolecular simulation, which again is for someone who uh, wants to start uh, access HPC uh, and run biomolecular simulations uh, on it. So we have a bit of a general overview about it and what the learning outcomes of the learning pathway are. Uh, and then if you go on start pathway, you have again uh, some general explanation about what the what the learning pathway contains. And then you can go to each of the different modules. It starts with the unique shell, which uh, will, will be important if you want to, to start using HPC. Uh, and here you have a description of uh, what this course is, and you can go and take this course. And we have a quiz to test your knowledge, which you can take after uh, going through the course, or if you think that you already have enough knowledge, you can go directly there uh, and check. And if you score highly in this uh, quiz, you can directly go to the next module on the SLARP workload manager. And again, here you have some resources and some narrative around them and a quiz at the end. And this is what uh, the learning pathways that we have contain. So if we go back here, um, apart from these more introductory courses, we have also some, again, courses for other uh, user groups. So here we have a researcher in biomolecular simulation who says, I have been using Gromax for some time, but now I need to learn about enhanced sampling methods for my new project. So they are a user of uh, one of the software that uh, BioXL provides, uh, but they need to know more, like more advanced methods in this uh, software. So BioXL also developed some uh, advanced Gromax workshop uh, specifically for this type of users that want, are, are already using the software, but want to learn more about it. So these are just a couple of examples, but of course, if you go on the, on the BioXL website or on the competency hub, you will see uh, some of the other training activities that BioXL has developed. Uh, and now I want to, to move on onto how you can use the BioXL competency framework to plan your own professional development. Uh, and what we are thinking here is, if you have a question such as what career options exist out there, so you might be doing your PhD or uh, being early in your postdoc and you have always been in academia, you know very clearly what's, what options are within academia, but you're thinking that maybe you want to try something else, but you have no idea what's out there. Uh, so the career profiles in the, that are associated with the, with the competency framework can help you identifying those other career options and taking a look and seeing whether they are for you. And then, you can also check how they compare to each other, or you can um, see 
what do you need to become a computational chemist or any other role that you are interested in? Or how do, can I develop my skills further? And this can be a very general question. Like, uh, again, you want to start running simulations in HPC or you want to start to program in Python or in R, uh, but you don't know exactly uh, how you can develop those skills or which training resources exist out there. Uh, and all that is something that the Competency Hub can help you with. So we will go to the to the Competency Hub, hub now, and I will uh, show you how you can do this. So the first thing will be to choose the relevant set of competencies. As and I told you, and as I told you, um, today we are going to be using this one in, on professionals in computational biomolecular research. So we can go there, and we choose. We start by choosing the, the framework that is more relevant for us. In this case, uh, we're gonna be using this one uh, today. And then the, the first page that we get there is the one with the career profiles. And here you can start answering those questions that we were having. And you can start by simply browsing them um, and you can see here we have computational chemists, we have a research software engineer, or you have a, a PI. Um, so then we are going to take a look at the junior research software engineer. And we have, this is the one that I had in my presentation as well. So you have uh, some information about their qualification and background, and then uh, some activities of their current role. And you can take a look at this and see that they are working in a center for high performance computing. Um, they are working on, on the software packages that are required for the researchers, so they are available for them. And they are also doing some uh, training for the researchers to use these, uh, these software packages. So this might be something that sounds interesting to you, or it might be something like, oh no, I don't want to do this. And then you can just go to, to another career profile. But if this some if this is something that you can find yourself in and that it's interesting to you, you can um, keep looking down here and you can also see that we have the whole uh, list of competencies and there's a, a scale associated to it about um, in three levels, awareness, working knowledge and specialist knowledge. Um, and then we go here and we can see that the first one, apply expertise in formal and natural uh, sciences appropriate to the discipline. Um, this junior research software engineer has level one on it. Uh, but, and then if you are doing your PhD, you can think, oh, I'm probably above level one, so I will be fine in this one. But then the next one is user-driven service provision and support. And you might not have any contact with the uh, users during your career. And then you might think, oh, they have level two here. So this is important for them. If I want to become a junior research software engineer, I really need to develop this uh, competency further. And you can take a look and see uh, what this uh, competency includes. For example, as a skill manages expectations effectively. Uh, and then you can start thinking about which uh, competencies you want to develop further if you want to become a, a junior research software engineer. So this is one way to go in the, in the competency hub. You can also then take a look at how it compares to, to another one. And you can then decide to choose the senior research software engineer to see which competencies will be the ones that you will need to develop further if you continue in that path from a junior research software engineer to a senior research software engineer. And then when you open this, you will see again the full list of competencies and there will be a comparison between um, between the two with uh, the levels in two. And you can see that the first one, apply expertise and natural sciences appropriate to the discipline, uh, they have the same level. So it's not something that they develop much further between one stage or, and the other. But uh, if you go uh, to, to this one or this one that it's about uh, data management, it's developed from level one and level three. So this is a, a competency that is considered really important in that work as a research software engineer, and you will need to keep developing it during your career there. And you can do that exercise for all the all the competencies here. But apart from from that, from just looking at the at the profiles that are on the side and, and thinking about 
how relate to your how they relate to your skills or how they relate to each other you can also add your profile yourself on the on the competency hub and when you add this it's saved on your browser so it's not going to be shared with anyone else or anything like that but it uh, it will be useful uh, to you you need to add uh, your name and job title and and I'm going to do it uh, quickly here so that you can see how it works. Uh, you can also add some of your qualification and background or activities of current role, but that's not uh, required. And then you can assign your uh, the competencies. And when you go here to, to assigning competencies, you can again click on them to expand them if you want to, to understand them better, what it means. Um, but I would recommend that you really use this if you're doing it that you use it to to assess yourself and to reflect on uh, on the skills you have because this can serve uh, to to check how it compares to some of the other career profiles here but it can also help you if you're writing a, a cv or if you're writing a job application to think about which competencies you would like to to highlight and maybe to help you um praising it to it might help you giving you some words on um, how to highlight uh, certain skills that you might have. So I'm gonna just um, click some of these uh, quickly so that you can see uh, how it works. So I will say user-driven service provision and support. I don't have that much. So I'm gonna leave it in awareness. Uh, this one is about literature and data sets. I'm gonna say working knowledge. Uh, and then there is data management, not much data analysis, not much either. And then I won't go very far in the computational ones. I'm gonna say that I know a little bit about Linux, but I'm not gonna say that much because I don't do that much uh, computational work. And also because um, we need to, um, to move on in this uh, webinar. So now I save this, um, this um, <coughs> profile. And you can see uh, what I what I added there and the levels that I added there. Of course, some of them are not applicable because I, I didn't get there. And once I have this uh, profile created, I can compare it and we'll uh, continue with the junior research software engineer as we have already working with it before. And then I select the junior research software engineer. I click compare and I'm going to see the levels of competencies that I added for myself in comparison with the ones for the junior research software engineer. And here we can see, as we were talking about, that probably I have a good level of uh, formal and natural sciences, but not so much uh, about user-driven uh, service provision and support. So if I want to become a junior research software engineer, this is a competency that I need to develop further. And it's the same, for example, for this one about data-driven science and how to use this data-driven science and data analysis uh, to generate hypotheses. So those two I would need to develop further if I want to become a junior research software engineer. Um, and then you might be thinking, so how do I develop this? You know, you can again see the full detail of the, of the competency here, but you might be thinking, well, what do I do to develop it further? Uh, and again, the competency hub can help you with that. But for this, we need to go back uh, to the to the framework. And I'll tell you, ideally, we we wouldn't need to go back. But for now, you will need to to go back to the to the competencies uh, and find the list of competencies and go to those competencies that you saw that you need to develop further, like the user driven service provision and support. And there, you can find some training resources associated with the competency or the other one about data-driven science. And again, you can find trained resources associated with the competency. And here you have all these trained resources and it's a quite long list, um, which uh, doesn't cover the full, most of the resources there don't cover the full competency because uh, they are short courses. So we'll cover uh, some elements of the competency, but not everything. Uh, but then you can have a look at it, get some inspiration about the things you can do. And depending on your level, you can decide to go one way or another. For example, this, a beginner's guide to interpreting results from biostatistics, it's, uh, as it says, it's, it's for, for beginners. And now it's not opening ah, there. Um, 
it's it's quite basic. So if you already know the basics from the concepts in biostatistics, you probably don't want to, to go here. But if you don't know the basics, this might be a good resource to start. Uh, but there are also quite a lot of resources on data management or programming in here. And then you can also decide based on what it's more what is done more in your discipline. So if programming in, in Python is something that your colleagues do and that uh, you think it's uh, gonna be required if you want to help your colleagues as a, a junior research uh, software engineer, you can go to learn uh, how to program in Python or how to do a specific analysis in R, for example. So if we go to this one in R again, you can see an overview of the, of the resource, which can help you decide if this is uh, something for you. Uh, and you can also see that this is from Software Carpentry. And then you can go to this resource uh, and start learning from there if this is something for, of interest for you. So when we came um, here to find these trained resources, uh, we had to go back from the comparison page between the two uh, the two career profiles, yours and the and the junior uh, software research uh, uh, research software engineer, uh, we had to go back to the list of competencies and find the training associated to these competencies. We would like uh, that this is changed so that you can directly from the from the page with the comparison that you can find directly the training resources. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how we have been working on that. On the slides, you will find some screenshots of what I've been doing now, uh, just in case this didn't work, and also for, for the record, so you can uh, see the slides when they are shared. But now if I go to this one, this is a, a prototype that we are working on, but it's not available on the website if you go now, uh, where when you do the, the profile between, let's say this is you, and, and then this is one of the profiles in the in the website, you will have a summary before the before the table uh, comparing the, the competency levels in the two. Uh, you will have this summary that tells you how many competencies you would need to develop further to, to become a bioinformatics researcher in this case. And then it will show you a button um, that says view suggested training resources. And if we go there, uh, it will show you those uh, competencies that you need to develop further with a list of suggested training resources that can help you with this. But this is not live uh, yet because there are some challenges in adding this here. So we would need to decide which training resources to include here because for some of the competencies, we have quite a lot of them. But as I said, they usually don't help you develop all the elements in the competency, but just some of them. So how do we decide which ones to include uh, here as a suggestion, the ones that are more complete, or depending on the level that you have and that you need to, to um, achieve. So those could be some considerations, but then we would need to see how to do that and how to make it uh, automated so that the system knows which ones to choose uh, and to show in this summary. Uh, we had this available in a simpler version at some point, uh, and this was just with a manually curated um, list of resources for each competency. But that's, of course, not sustainable if we want to use it in, in several frameworks uh, with the growing list of trained resources that we have available there. So if you have any ideas about how we can, we can do this in an, in an efficient way, uh, let us know, because we, we welcome suggestions. Uh, and apart from that, uh, we are also working on trying to make the site more user-friendly and make it clear there so that people understand what you can do on the site because we do some user feedback sessions when we develop the site. And usually people tell us that it's very nice and that the information um, looks interesting and can be useful, but they are not, especially in the beginning, they are not uh, sure what they can do and how to use the site. Uh, so we'll keep working on that and we will keep uh, gathering user feedback in uh, feedback sessions. We'll also work on updating the competency frameworks. As I told you, they cannot be static. They need a constant update for the competencies, the career profiles, and the training resources. And we will also uh, aim to create uh, more learning pathways. Uh, and this is um, uh, almost the end of the presentation today. So just as a summary, uh, competency frameworks provide a structured approach to training, uh, design, and career planning. 
Uh, the Ember ABI Competency Hub includes nine frameworks from life sciences areas, and they are all openly available. And the BioXL training program is based on a competency framework. We welcome suggestions in relation to both the Competency Hub and the BioXL Competency Framework for uh, Computation Biomolecular Research. So you can contact us at uh, competency at uh, ebi.ac.uk or in my personal uh, email address. Uh, and I would like to finish thanking the Embel EBI training team and the Embel EBI web development team, uh, which have been essential to develop all this work. And also um, the groups working on developing competencies like the one from the International Society for Computational Biology, Permit COE and BioXL, which have contributed both to developing competency frameworks and to developing the Embel ABI Competency Hub, and all the other initiatives that have contributed to uh, developing competency frameworks that are now in the, in the Competency Hub. And thank you very much for your attention. I uh, will be happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you very much, Marta. And uh, I was suggesting that if people ask uh, questions, since I don't see any questions written in the Q&A, they can just uh, raise hand and we can just unmute them so they can just ask questions directly. So now we see if there are any questions coming up so people can think about. In the meantime, I have a question. When you were mapping the training with the, we are using the competency app for the training, you didn't really start from mapping first the competence and then building the training. You I understood that you first built the training and then associate the competence, is correct? No, no. So, I mean, there are, there are two things here. So one is we, define the competencies. And then from those competencies, let's say, we found out where the main training needs were for the main user groups. So for example, we have this introduction to HPC because we understand that there are certain groups of users um, that have no experience with HPC and would like to be using it. So that's a need and that's part of the competencies, how to access this. Um, resources. So for the courses that we have developed, they are based on the competencies and the training needs, because usually as they are short courses, they cannot cover a full competency. So they will be in general focusing on several elements of maybe two or three competencies. So they are based in a co combination of the competencies and the training needs. Um, and then another thing is that uh, there's other training that is available out there. And, and I didn't go in, in detail into that. But when we build the competency framework, another exercise that we did was to check training that was available out there in different providers of training, such as the ABI, Coursera, Software Carpentries, and this kind of things. And we associated that training with the competencies to see for which competencies there were more resources already available there and in which competencies there was a lack of training so that we could fill uh, those gaps. Okay, okay. So you combine the, the training need that you got from some speaking with, with the user somehow. Mm -hmm. and, then, and, then, and then in this way, you were looking which competence you need to fulfill this need, and then you yeah. develop the training. Okay, now it's uh, it's more clear. So I wonder if other there are can arise question from the people online. Everybody can raise their hand if they want. I can unmute you. Yeah, Javier has a question. I allowed him to speak. Please, Javier. Uh, thank you for the really nice presentation. It was kind of interesting. Uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify one uh, question, whether the training materials that have been, uh, that was mentioned, uh, the training resources which have been mentioned in, in uh, the competency framework, would they be um, uh, somehow uh, uh, stored within the competency uh, hub or is it uh, like redirecting to a third party uh, uh, resource 
the reason why I'm asking is that let's say uh, if it's a third party resource and if it gets updated, but if it's not, you know, linked to this, then probably you might end up with some dead link and then not being yeah. able. Yeah. So they are linking to third party uh, resources. So it's not. I mean, of course, some of them would be BioXL ones, and they would be linking to the BioXL page or so. Uh, but we do some regular checks of the links so that uh, if there's some dead link, we remove that resource from the competency hub. Um, the idea of having of having resources linked to, I mean, links to third-party resources, it's because then we can cover uh, more competencies and more elements of competencies that what we could uh, cover only with what uh, we are developing ourselves. So it can be of more use uh, to the community. And then it's true that when we select what to add, I would say we try to select more and more resources that are online and the resources that are from third parties that it's more likely that they keep things updated. So if we have um, a one-off workshop that someone runs, it's less likely that this is updated than if it's a Coursera uh, data science specialization or something like that, uh, because this is usually updated regularly. Or all those software carpentry basic courses in programming or Unix shell or all that, at least for now, they are updated. And in fact, uh, the pages look completely different now to what they looked last year, even though the, the content is more or less the same, but they are really updating it. So we do keep an eye on that. And of course, there will be some dead links uh, sometimes, but we try to, to keep an eye on that and remove them. Do you want to comment, uh, Javier? Oh, yeah, I, I'm done, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. There is any other question? No, if not, I will just uh, show the... Uh, if you can uh, stop sharing, I just show the what are the following webinar. So let me just go to my share screen. Okay. So then uh, I we will have uh, we have a following. We have on the twenty first of October. We will have at uh, three o'clock as usual. We will have a student webinar. This is a special webinar. We have run a summer school in September and we have select three students that are winning the poster prize. And those three students will give a short presentation on their project. And then we will have a normal BioXL webinar on the 14th of November at the three o'clock. And uh, this webinar will be run by Giovanni Bussi from CISA and he will be speaking about the thermostat and barostat in molecular dynamics simulation. And uh, I thank you for your attendance. And uh, yeah, looking forward to meet you again. Bye bye.